As the dust settled following the 36th America's Cup down here in Auckland, attention started to focus on the next one, as the Kiwis were starting to think about what they could do to put on an even better show in Barcelona. One of the things that was on their minds followed on from what they'd learned out here in the Haraki Gulf. They wanted to create a better impression for spectators about what was really happening on the race course. So, working with one of the world's leading experts, Cap Gemini, they came up with a very clever idea. An idea that was not only groundbreaking, but one that could find its way into other areas of the sport. And while those who watched the racing on screen saw the development, the technology behind it was never really explained. Until now. From the outside, as spectators, we can see every move. Thanks to some fancy overlays, we can judge every action against the advantage lines on the course. We can see the speed of the boats. We know when they're gaining and when they've lost out. We can monitor every move. But there's one thing we can't see, at least not as well as the crew, the wind. Until now, because last summer, the America's Cup delivered a breakthrough allowing us to see the invisible. But before we dive into that, what's it like to be a wind spotter and a strategist on board a cup boat? How hard can it be? Imagine riding a motorbike along the seafront with your helmet on and your visor down. As you ride at 40 mile an hour, you need to spot the gusts offshore. You need to know their strength, when they'll get to you, and whether they're providing a shift. You'll also need to do the odd 90 degree turn. But you'll still need to identify which patch of water out there is delivering the best breeze. Because that's what it's like aboard an AC-75 with your helmet on. Insulated from the weather, spotting the breeze on the other side of the course at 35 knots. And that's when things are going well. We started discussions with America's Cup about sponsorship and we wanted to bring some technology to it and we asked what kind of problems have you got? And the one that, that Grant Dalton mentioned straight away was that he wanted to make the wind visible on the broadcast. I think historically they'd always tried to move the technology forward with each America's, each America's Cup. And clearly the bit that was missing and the decisive factor from a race viewpoint was well, what is the wind doing? You know, and if you listen to the commentaries, you, know, you get a lot of, well, we think the wind is doing this or it might be doing this. And maybe you get a little bit of information on the overall wind speed and direction. But as a viewer, that's all you really have. And I think the whole idea was to make the, the broadcast experience just more understandable to people. Mm. So when a boat went left or right, the commentators could much more easily explain why the, the skipper had made that particular decision. And it's never been done before, let's be absolutely clear on this, is it's never been, been done before. Emirates Team New Zealand had done some initial work with the University of Canterbury um, in New Zealand to look at theoretically whether it was, was possible. Okay. So they gave us that, that, that initial, initial work and then we started from, from there. We use meteorological long-range LIDARs. On it, okay. And what is a LIDAR? So a LIDAR is basically what it is, it's a, it's a beam of light, okay, and that light reflects back off something, okay, and from that you can deduce things like distance or speed. Right, right. So, um, because it's bouncing back. Because it's bouncing back, Doppler effect. What's special about the LIDARs that we're using is, is the range, okay. So here we're looking to between 6 and 12 kilometres. So the, each of our LIDARs that we're using is sort of 100 kilograms. These are significant pieces of equipment. Um, and normally you'd use them for something like the classic application would be wind turbine planning. So let's say you want to open a wind farm, okay? You'd put these devices in the area, okay? And you'd let them run for months, okay? And then you come back and collect all the data. And from that, you'd be able to optimize Okay, what was the right orientation of the of the wind turbines? Right? And they're, and, and they're, what they're measuring is the wind speed. So yeah, so historical what, so data the way on, 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 on wind, wind speed, speed and direction. direction. So, right. the, so what they what they do is they emit um, a beam of light. Okay, and that light reflects off impurities in the air, like dust or, or pollution. Okay, 
and that, reflect, that reflection is then sensed, okay? And from that, we can deduce the velocity of the wind, i.e. its speed in its, in its direction. So we, each, of the, each of the LIDARs that we, that we use emits 10,000 beams per second, okay? So over the Barcelona, over, over the Barcelona Bay Area, um, see, here's, here's the coast of Barcelona, okay? Here's a typical race area you can see in the, in the middle. So we have one LIDAR um, up here, which is on top of a water reprocessing plant. We have one LIDAR next to the W Hotel. Oh, yes. And then we have one south at the, at the port, um, at the port of Barcelona. So we have three of them. And these are temporary devices. These are here put here specifically for yes. the cup. Yes. You've got three LIDARs. Each individual LIDAR emits 10,000 pulses per second. So we have 30,000 pulses of light going over the flooding the race area. And it goes out as a fan. I presume it's not yeah. like a beam of light. No, it's a it? scan. We, and yeah. we, 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 so basically, there's a the, 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 the lidars do this. They all, they all, each lidar does that. Right. Okay. Um, so it scans. Um, so at the beginning of the race, um, we spend a lot of time. At the beginning of the day, we spend a lot of time um, precisely configuring the lidars for the race conditions and the wind conditions. So it's not like a, you don't set this. It's not set up and forget. We do a lot of optimization in terms of the um, um, the arc itself, the speed at which we um, scan, okay, how long we, we loiter in, in, in the air, if you like, how to, to, to record the data. So then um, that all that data is then fused together. And, and the really clever bit is then how do you actually fuse that together to create an overall, an overall wind field? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the bit that we've, you know, we, we've registered a, a patent to get a joint patent with, with Emirates Team New Zealand and how we do that. Um, and that enables us to generate a new infield once per second into the broadcast system. That's why you're seeing such a, a big um, amount of separation between the boats. The New Zealanders have pushed all the way to that right-hand side to get into that pressure that the LiDAR raid is, is showing on the right. They've really worked. It's like sailing in Auckland off the East Coast Bay's bread and butter for Peter Burling. This is the area that we're scanning, OK? And we divide it up into 10 metre squared sections of air, if you like, OK? And each 10 meters squared section will receive at least one LIDAR beam every 15 seconds. Okay. Right? So what happens is you've got a combination of measurement and prediction. So if you can imagine that the race course is sort of divided into, it's just under a quarter of a million cells. Okay? And each of those cells is either um, we do a forecast of what the wind's going to do in that individual cell, or it's received a measurement. Oh, okay. Okay. So, there's, so each of those quarter of a million cells is constantly being updated with predictions and measurements as the different lidars are scanning. So where a lidar has not received, where where a cell has not received a measurement from a lidar, we do a prediction step. Okay. And that in, and then we then regularly um, send the one second refresh to the broadcast system, um, so they know when they're going to get an, an updated refresh. Uh, we use a thing called a common filter, if you really want to go into the depths of it. And actually, common filters are a well-established engineering tool for where you, where you have a, a physics model of a phenomenon, like we do with the wind, and then you're also you're trying to update that physics model with real-time measurements from the real world, which is what, which is what, we're, doing, right. what we're doing here. Yeah? So the, the, the LiDAR system itself is very, very dynamic. Um, um, so what, you, what you've got on here is information about the, the range because the range of the li each of the LIDARs varies a lot with atmospheric conditions, mm. okay? So, um, and also depending on the composition of the, of the air, we get different levels of energy loss in terms of the amount of the light that gets reflected back. So a lot of the skill of the engineers involved in this, again, is optimizing the LIDARs based on the range that we've got and the composition of the, of the atmosphere. Um, as a, as a very uh, simple example, if it rains, I was just going to ask that. Yeah, <laughs> if it if it if it rain if it rains, we lose range and all the impurities get washed out of the air. Oh. Okay, so we have a significant drop off in in, in lidar performance How when it when it rains. Know the know the difference between a rain drop. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. We just either get a reflection back or we or we don't. Okay, so. Um, 
and then what happens is after it, after it has rained, it then takes a while for the atmosphere, if you like, to recover. Yeah. For it then to get more 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 air, more dust particles or pollution in the in the air for us to start to get good good measurements mm. good measurements back. So during the during an actual um, race, we're in constant communication with the rest of the broadcast system to say you know we we have a valid wind field we have a wind field that we have confidence in. Um, so when you, when you see it broadcast on the TV, it's a wind field that we know is a sound wind right. field. Okay, so when um, you've probably seen the ghost boat simulations yeah. because obviously because we've got now such an accurate view of the, the wind field um, and um, AC Media have got a very good simulation of an AC 75 in, in including you know be, being tailored to the polars of the of, of each team right um, that means you can then start to run simulations based on that on, on that wind field which you've seen on the TV you know what's the best site to, to start you know where the boat's going to be at the next cross, etc., and, and you can do that because you've got such an accurate view of the wind field. One thing that's been really hard with this project actually is how do you visualise something as complex and dynamic as the wind in a way that people can actually understand. So this project has been really two teams. We've had a significant design team involved, okay, as well as an engineering technical team. So the design team have worked a lot with the media team, okay, and with surveys, et cetera, to work out what's the best way to represent it. So what you've ended up with is um, the color of the sea is the average wind speed across the, across the race course. That's the color of the sea, okay? And anything that's green towards yellow is av higher than the average um, of the race course. Anything that goes dark blue, okay, is the lower, is a lull, effectively. Right. Right, and for you to see it on the broadcast, there needs to be about a twenty-five percent difference from the, the mean the mean wind. Okay. Okay. One of the fascinating things, apart from being able to visualise the invisible, is actually seeing how good the sailors are, the teams are at spotting those gusts. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible, uh, isn't it? We're for the very first time getting to see what they can see. Yes, and I think I think especially given that you know they're doing forty. Exactly. Forty odd knots. Wearing a helmet. Wearing a helmet. <laughs> you know, with spray everywhere. Yeah. The fact that they can actually pick out, you know, in many instances these quite subtle changes is really quite extraordinary. Yeah. Obviously, it's easy for us because we can see. It. We can yeah, see. Yeah, I suppose we should. Um, we should make it clear that they can't. They can't see any of this data. This no, is purely for spectators. This, is this is purely yeah, goes on. The data is absolutely not available to the to the um, to the teams. I have to say, at the beginning, when I first saw this, I thought. Impressed though I was, I was concerned that it was actually going to show up the sailors, and so we'd be able to see something they couldn't see, and we'd be seeing what a mess they make of it. But of course, I totally underestimated just how good they are, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, they can, and, and it's flipped on its head. And yeah. it's every time yeah. I see it now, I find it yeah. absolutely remarkable how they can spot these shifts, puffs, and they're doing, as you say, 40 knots, yeah. got a helmet on, spray all over the place being rattled around, it's just incredible, it's yeah. amazing. From an R&D viewpoint, we thought we, we build it, we integrate it with the, the mm. rest of the broadcast systems and then we can sort of put a technician here mm. to then operate it and that's absolutely not been the case. You know, we have to have very, very skilled senior engineers here who really understand the physics of the mm. LIDARs and also really understand how the algorithms actually work to get the right, the, the best accuracy from, yeah. from the system. Mustang survival might not be that well known outside of North America, but this season sees the company launch new ranges of foul weather gear and life jackets into the wider sailing scene. Aimed at long distance offshore sailing and designed to cope with some of the most extreme conditions, the EP 6.5 Ocean Collection is based on military spec Gore-Tex fabric. American solo sailor Cole Brower is among those who've trialled this kit on her 27,000 mile race around the world. The Meris foul weather gear range is built to the same high standards 
but is aimed at coastal and offshore use. A jacket and salopettes is also due to be launched this spring. The third new area is the Atlas 190 Newton Life Jacket, which has drawn plenty of attention and acclaim since its recent launch. In addition to a long list of features, one of the key objectives was to create a life jacket that was comfortable and supple to wear. Zyke have had a pretty good run of results recently in some tough environments. The 100-foot Huang K Design Law Connect took line honours for the second time in the Sydney to Hobart race. The crew were all wearing Zyke kit for a race that was pretty challenging from the start. Among the popular items for tactician and watch leader Chris Nicholson, the new Sea Boots 700, the Thermals and the OFS 900 smock stood out. Fully breathable and with an impressive grip, the boots were especially popular everywhere else on deck. Those on the rail were giving the thumbs up to the OFS 900 jacket. Meanwhile, Jan Richom took Zyke's OFS 900 and OFS 800 ranges, along with the Seaboot 900, to second place in a tightly fought Vendée Globe aboard Paprec Arkea. Not a bad way to start the year at all. Once again, and as always, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe to us, it's free, it doesn't cost anything, and you won't get spammed, but it does make a big difference as to what we can do on the channel. Plus, make sure you hit the notification bell to stay up to date with new content. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and of course our website. Plus, if you'd like to talk to us about advertising, sponsorship, or indeed any other commercial issue, we'd love to talk to you. So please do drop us a line. So wherever you are in the world, from down here in Auckland, fair winds, and we'll see you next time.